God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. Well, good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study here at the Op Church of Christ. My name is Trey Poole. I'm the minister of the gospel right here at the Op Church of Christ. I'm excited to be with you tonight. I know that if you're watching this live with me, uh, it is a little bit early uh, than normal, but uh, we've got a storm uh, quickly coming upon us, so I wanted to get it posted, and I wanted to be able to uh, be at the house uh, when the storm got worse and worse through the night. So with that in mind, I want to encourage you to stay safe. Uh, go ahead and uh, make your plans to stay in tonight. Don't know exactly when the storm's going to hit, but it is coming. We want to pray. For all those who are in the path of this storm, Zeta. So please do be careful. But we're glad that you're with us tonight, church members, family, friends, loved ones, visitors, whomever you may be. We're excited that you are tuned in and that you'll be watching and sharing this time with us together. Church family, we've got some announcements uh, and some prayer requests that we want to share with you tonight as we get started. On Wednesday night, December the 2nd, we will start back with all of our classes, our kids' classes, the adult classes, uh, that will start our winter quarter. That is Wednesday night, December the 2nd. Very excited about that. Uh, also, uh, you may want to know, maybe you already know, uh, but we have uh, canceled Trunk or Treat for this coming Saturday. So we have, sorry about that, but we felt it would be uh, necessary to do that for everyone's safety. And with that in mind as well, until further notice, we are doing only online Facebook live streaming of our services, Sunday morning at 1030, Sunday night at 5 o'clock, and Wednesday nights at 6. Hopefully we can resume in-person worship assemblies really soon. We want to remember these in our prayers. Gary Hall, Tim Meadows, Jay and Kathy Michael, and Alan Jones uh, have all tested positive for uh, COVID-19. There may be others, maybe those who are awaiting test results. Uh, maybe we have updates on these, but as of right now, that's what we know. We want to be praying for them and so many others that I know you, you are aware of. Richie Bedsole, he's dealing with uh, uh, some health issues. Uh, we want to continue to pray for him. Carl Hollinghead will be seeing a orthopedic surgeon soon for his leg and his knee. Please remember him. Carrie Allen, Chrissy Hughes' sister, she's pregnant. She's had a stroke, uh, believed to be caused by a blood clot, and they're running many tests to find out more. Uh, please continue to pray for Ralph and uh, Faye Donaldson in the passing of her sister, Betty McCants. Uh, Jesse Garner's sister, Jesse Garner, lives in uh, Luverne. He used to attend here, but now he's over in Luverne. His sister, Melissa Beasley, uh, she is still in Jackson's Hospital in Montgomery, but she is improving, so uh, keep on praying. Uh, there are a lot of people who are shut in, confined to their homes, uh, sick with other illnesses besides uh, COVID-19, uh, not related to COVID-19. Uh, those who are battling cancer, a lot of people are dealing with grief and the uh, loss of loved ones. We want to be prayerful uh, for them. And as always, as we go to God together in prayer tonight, uh, I want to encourage you to just lift up uh, those concerns, the, the families, the situations that are going on uh, in your own life, in your own family uh, that you are aware of. Uh, please lift those up uh, to God as we go to Him in prayer together. Will you bow with me as we pray? Father God, we thank you so much for your love and for your tender mercy. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have tonight to assemble together, to worship you in spirit and in truth, and to study from your holy word. Father, we have many uh, friends and family church members during this upcoming election. Uh, may we as your children get out and vote 
And Father, we pray that uh, righteous men and women will be elected uh, to offices and will lead us and guide us in the way that you'd have us to go. Father, we thank you most of all tonight for your son Jesus, for the love that he has for us, for the sacrifice he made at the cross. And we pray, Father, every day that you will forgive us for our sins, help us to walk more closely to Jesus, for it's through him that we humbly pray. Amen. All right, well, I want to share a song with you. It's about four or five minutes long. It is a powerful song uh, to get us into the, the mindset of our lesson tonight. The song is entitled, Lead Me Gently Home, Father. And I want you to pay attention to the uh, soprano and the bass parts. If you like harmony and you like good uh, melody and you like the different parts, this is a beautiful, beautiful
I don't know if you heard or saw that, but had a voicemail come through at just the right time. If you have your Bible tonight, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter number 18. We'll get there in just a moment. Go ahead and hold them up high. I got uh, several sheets, sheets of paper over here that are about to fall off. I got everything going on, got it all under control, and so glad to be with you uh, tonight as we uh, keep all of this uh, going as we get into God's Word, it is super to be with you tonight to share the Word of God together. Jeremiah chapter 18 is where we're going to spend most of our time tonight. But like it or not, we are facing and dealing with a new reality. Now, I don't think we will go back to a pre-virus normal. Do you feel like you have maybe fallen through Alice is looking glass sometimes. So, what do we do in this new reality? Well, the way I see it is this. We have a choice to make. We can bemoan the loss of the old normal, or we can embrace the new mission with these new opportunities. Now, the mission itself is the same as the church, as Christians. But in this new reality, we have new opportunities uh, to be a part of that ongoing mission. It reminds me almost of what Mordecai told Esther. In Esther chapter 4, verse 14, he said, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Isn't that a great thought? For such a time as this. Perhaps this new reality that we're all facing is our for such a time as this. You see, Esther made her choice to do what she could do to help the Jewish people. Even, even in a state of uncertainty chaos, weakness, and lack of control. What this time has underscored the most in the reality that even with dreams and plans of our own, we must surrender and submit to the ultimate will and purpose of God in our lives. Even in the midst of uncertainty or chaos or weakness or the lack of control, this time that we are living in, the circumstances that we are dealing with and adapting to each and every day should help us to remind ourselves to surrender and submit to the ultimate will and the purpose of God in our lives. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 teach us to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, your Bible says, Many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. The counsel of the Lord will stand. It's like, it's like when you receive a phone call and you don't answer it, and they leave you a voicemail. That voicemail is there. Is there until you get rid of it or delete it. It will stand. And sometimes those phone calls or those voice messages, they appear on your phone at maybe just the right time when you really don't want it to, to come up. But there it is. And, and with the word of God, the counsel of the Lord will stand forever. You see, with everything going on in this world, God is trying to get our attention. But are we listening to God? Do we even hear His voice over all the noise in the world? I was reminded of Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 23 and 24, where Scripture says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his own steps. Verse 24 says, Correct me, O Lord, but with justice, not with your anger, or you will bring me to nothing. 
You see, Jeremiah was facing not only a personal crisis, but he was also dealing with a national crisis. Jeremiah was facing a personal crisis in the face of a national crisis. He knew the hearts of Israel were turned against God, and he, that is Jeremiah, is admitting to the need for all people to understand that we need God. We need God. So, Jeremiah prays for God's mercy. He prays for God's grace. And this is where we often find ourselves. At the very bottom, nowhere to go and no relief in sight. Maybe we even feel that God has allowed us to be reduced to nothing, with no purpose and without hope. You see, when our plans for our life become interrupted or even worse, canceled, we often become blinded by frustration, pain-filled frustration, because we've suffered loss. The loss of anything, and you can, you can fill in the blanks there. So much loss. I want to share something with you that I saved from Facebook. It says, difficult things come during our life on earth. Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, accidents, and illness are all a part of earthly life. People are afflicted with terrible diseases. Marriages dissolve in divorce, and children are murdered. People lose all their life's savings because of corrupt, uh, corporate corruption and fraud and greed. No one is immune to the storms that come in earthly life. Earthly problems provide motivation for faith in God and for us to want to go to heaven. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, we read, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the oil may fail, or the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills. We must live life for and with God. And never allow the circumstances of life to bring us to defeat and despair. We have something to cling to. And someone to look to in our troubles. Let us look to God and lean on Him every day, especially in times of trouble. And that was that was some encouraging words from a good preaching friend, Charles Box. So we need to remember this: God is at work in every aspect of our life. No matter what we may see or feel or be experiencing, we need to realize that God is at work in every aspect of our lives. We are like, we're like clay in the very hands of God, the master potter. All right, let's get to Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. The word of God which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And in the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build 
and to plant it. If it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Verse 12, And they said, That is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans, and we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. Those are 12 powerful passages there in Jeremiah chapter 18. You see, the potter's job is to shape and to mold the clay. And sometimes that potter has to remake and rework that clay when it's necessary. Go back to verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. So there is that reshaping, that reworking, that remolding of a marred vessel in the hands of the master potter. I want to share something with you that came to mind while I was working this lesson together. It's a poem by Myra Brooks Welch. Maybe you've heard of this poem. It's entitled, The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who will start bidding for me?' A dollar? A dollar. Then two. Only two? Two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars once. Three dollars twice. Going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quite low, said, What am I bidding for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, he said. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We don't quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scattered with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Oh, I've always loved that poem. Those words, the touch of the master's hand, makes all the difference. And tonight we need to really understand that God's image in us is marred by sin. God's image is marred in each and every one of us by sin. Sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Sin mars God's image in us, and no one is exempt. In fact, your Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
in verse 23 of that same chapter. Paul goes on and says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you know what? God wants his image back. God desires for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, Romans 8 and verse 29. I was reading about a police officer who was eating with some of his fellow officers, and he made this statement. He said, I mess up every day. The response came back, join the club. Maybe you can relate to joining that club. We all mess up. We all sin. We all fall short of what God would have us to be and to do. I think about Abraham. Abraham was imperfect, but God reworked Abraham, so that he was able to sacrifice Isaac. You remember the scene there in Genesis chapter 22. God knew that as Abraham raised up that knife, that Abraham was going to do it. And so God stopped him, provided a, another way. I think about Peter. You remember how Peter denied the Lord three times, but yet God worked on Peter until Peter died a martyr's death? But what about you and me? What about you? What about me? We may be living in despair. We may be thinking that God has given up on us or that our sin is too great or too horrible for God to forgive us. There's no way that God could forgive me or you of that sin or those sins. Well, there's a Hebrew word for that. The Hebrew word here for this is baloni. Say it again. Baloni. Baloni. God can and God will forgive. God wants to forgive. But still, God patiently works with us. He works on us like that master potter, molding and shaping, sometimes remolding and reworking and reshaping that vessel until he's got us just like he desires. Let's go back for just a moment to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 4 through about verse 6. Verse 4 again says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred, in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation, and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. You see, we are in the potter's hands. We are in the master potter. God himself is shaping us and molding us into the vessel that he desires us to be. Now I think there's a song in our song book that kind of sums up the attitude that you and I need to have in our lives, especially in such a time as this, this new reality that we are dealing with and adapting to. It's in our song book here at the church building. It's number 197. The song is entitled, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Listen to this. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. 
Hold over my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always living in me. You see, God uses the circumstances. God uses the circumstances and the situations of life to mold us and to shape us. If we will let him. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 18. Let's pick back up in verse number 7. God says, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And in the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Verse 11. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. You remember, God is the potter. God is the potter. You and I, we're the clay. There in the master potter's hands, on the wheel as he is turning and shaping and molding, reworking us to make us more and more like Jesus. But God knows our weaknesses and he knows that we are formed from the dust of the ground, Psalm 103 and verse 14. And as clay, we must admit to and acknowledge God's greatness and his power and our own humility and weakness. John tells it like this in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, if we say we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Even in and through our weaknesses, God shows his power. He shows his power, his grace, and his might. You remember Paul's thorn in the flesh? Whatever it was, Paul did not want it, nor did he like it. But guess what? God used it in Paul's life. Take a moment and, and turn with me. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number... Actually, number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh, Paul says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We all have weaknesses. God can and will work in and through and even with our weaknesses, demonstrating his power, his grace, and his might. I'm reminded of Paul's words elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 when he wrote, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You see, in and of ourselves, we are weak. We are flawed. We are messed up. We've failed. We've missed the mark. 
but our focus must be on God. On what God can do and what God wants to do as the master potter, as it reworks and reshapes us into the image of Christ, if we will humbly submit to and surrender to Him. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul wrote, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So tonight, as we, as we kind of wind this thing down and close it out, I want you to go back with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, I want you to look with me at verse 12. Here in verse number 12, I want you to notice the response. Notice what they said uh, concerning God's warning and God's instructions. There in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 12, the scripture says, And they said, That is hopeless so we will walk according to our own plans and we will everyone obey the dictates of his evil heart what's our response to what we see going on in and around the world do we say that's hopeless where is god what's god doing and why why is this happening? Why isn't God doing something? You see, often we'll say, God's not doing anything. Let's just do whatever we want to do. Remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7? Paul wrote there, For we walk, live, by faith and not by sight. We walk, we live by faith and not by sight. My friends, we need to realize tonight that God has a reason for allowing things to happen. And we may never understand His wisdom, but we simply have to trust His will. We have to trust His will. Even in our moments of weakness, when we've hit rock bottom, we don't understand, but we want to do what God is teaching us to do. Now, I want, to, I want to close with a powerful story. It is a powerful story about a young boy who was born without a left arm. Maybe you've heard this. Let me share it with you. There's a little boy who signed up for jujitsu. That's a, a form of martial arts. But he had a disability. He was born without his left arm. But he went to the classes anyway. When he got there, his master, the instructor, noticed that he was missing an arm, his left arm. So he pulled him aside and told him to practice this one move. And he showed the little boy what that move was. Just that one move. So the boy practiced that one move while all the other students were aside working on other things. Every practice, he would go and work on that one move over and over and over again. One day the competition came up and the master said to this young boy that he was going and he was going to compete. But the little boy asked, I only have one arm. I can't really compete. The master told him to go, compete, so he went. He gets there to the competition, to this tournament. He gets ready for round one of the tournament. And at the end of round one, guess what? He's the winner. Moves on to round two. Goes on to round two, and he wins round two. Moves on to round three. And this little boy, who only has one arm, missing his left arm, moves on to round three, and he wins round three. Now he's in the finals. His opponent for the championship match is the best warrior at the competition. He tells his master, he says, how can I beat him when I only know one move and only have one arm? I don't have a left arm. All I've got is a right arm, and all I know is one move. I don't even have two arms. 
His master told him, just stick with your one move. So the boy listened to his master, and he sticks with that one jujitsu move that he has learned and practiced over and over and over again. And guess what? He ends up winning the entire tournament. Picture that. A young boy who does not have a left arm, only knows one move in jiu-jitsu, and he wins the entire tournament. He's the grand champion. All the way back home, he asked his master, he asked, why did you show me only one move? His master replied, the move that I taught you and the move that you have practiced every day, time and time and time again, that one move is the hardest move in jiu-jitsu. He went on and told his young student, and the only way to defeat this one move is to grab the opponent by his left arm and pin him. Think about that. You see, it's about using our weaknesses. Here's that young boy. Doesn't have a left arm, but his jujitsu master instructor taught him the one move that would end up winning the tournament with. It's about using our weaknesses to our advantage, allowing God to use even our weaknesses to accomplish His great purpose in our lives. God gave those to us for a reason. For we know that God works in all things for our eternal good. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them called according to His purpose. Even in our perceived weaknesses, even in the weaknesses that we struggle with every single day, God's power can be demonstrated. God wants to work in us and through us. And as the master potter, God wants a willing, pliable lump of clay that he can mold and shape in all of its weakness and all of its flaws, even if it has to be reshaped and reworked because it was marred there in the master potter's hands. Think about the power of God at work in our lives. Think about what God can do. Think about the power that God wants to demonstrate in our lives. So, like it or not, we are facing and dealing with a new reality. Are we going to embrace the new mission as the church, as Christians, the mission that God has given to us to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Even with all of our weaknesses and all of our sins and all of our flaws, remember, God is the master potter. God will transform and shape and mold us and work us into the image of of Jesus Christ, if we will let him. Will you bow as we pray? Father God, we love you. We thank you so much for tonight and the opportunity we have to be together. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to see you at work in our lives and in the lives of other people at work in the world around us. Dear God, help us to trust you more. Strengthen our faith. Open our eyes that we can see you and all that's going on around in the world, that you're using it for your glory. Father, help us to be a part of that master plan, your eternal purpose, your eternal will in Christ Jesus. Father, help us to get out of your way and to let you work in us and through us as the master potter. Father, help us to have the attitude of have thine own way, Lord. Work in our hearts, work in our lives, make us more and more like you. For we pray through Christ, amen. Well, church folks, y'all, stay safe, stay grounded, stay connected in God's word. Be careful in this storm that's coming. 
I'm going to shut this thing down and head to the house and get ready myself. But stay safe. If you need me, call me, send me a text message, let me know what's going on. And uh, hope and pray uh, next time as we uh, record Facebook Live. There won't be any little hiccups along the way, but sometimes there are. We deal with them. We roll with them. We work with them as they come. But we love you. God bless you. Take care. And we'll see you soon.